Okay, sorry. Uh, good morning, everyone. So, um, the, I want to welcome everyone to the second day of the Daily Asia workshop. I hope you had a great day yesterday. Also, I hope you enjoyed that um, dinner yesterday. It was great. I really enjoyed the talk with you guys. Thank you for your uh, participation. And uh, so, uh, we are back in here, the uh, University, uh, National University of Singapore, the faculty world here. And this is uh, made possible by the uh, wonderful colleague, Julian Daniels, of our team. Uh, he, uh, your also, it has been amazing for this last uh, day. So thank you so much. Then I want to thank you to the join us here and it will be helping us. So thank you very much. So um, yesterday we had so many great presentations. Uh, how many guys? I'm still kind of processing. Right? So many topics and diverse uh, uh, kind of top the interest, also the backgrounds that kind of. Um, in here, but I, I think we kind of hit the first objective of this workshop, which is to summarize the current standard for the environmental measurement of and trying to find out sort of the the area that we can improve um, based on what we have, then adding some more measurement or modeling to improve our capabilities. So uh, today uh, is more like trying to hit the next uh, two objectives, which is say uh, to identify so the priority of the measurement and also uh, modeling also plus last one is to sort of I don't know, next step what we what we, what we can do in the next step so it's going to be challenging but I am really really looking forward to uh, have a conversation with you guys um, so just a, a little housekeeping stuff um, so again the this meeting is being recorded so the recording will be available to everyone after the conclusion of this workshop uh, from the GEM website and um, the other thing is also program uh, the available programs is available from the website, the event site. And um, yeah, then we have uh, more than 25, uh, more than 25 presentations yesterday. So you know, the uh, if you are interested in go, uh, going back to um, the doing some of the presentation, it's going to be great um, the material for you guys to going back if you want to also someone you wanted to uh, go back. And um, yeah, yesterday, so we have six uh, country based country also region based uh, sessions and each uh, each session represents science technology also policy and basically focusing on that region or country um, to specifically working on um, uh, the expert from the country so that's uh, that's been great uh, just a little bit of uh, my my own version of summary a little quick but you know I really need your help this is my version of it um, but first of all I the like I like we mentioned that this is diverse that we just can't describe it Asia, just one word, so many different topics. But at the same time, we see lots of common things, especially uh, like measurement we are uh, conducting over different countries, also region. We, we see have lot, so many measurement, also greenhouse measurement. And compared to uh, what, I, what I typically work on in North America or the Europe, and I see more focus on air quality measurement. They're also interestingly, looking at same measurement, we are looking at quite different numbers. And just looking at uh, the air quality level, the people aiming different levels, then that represent the current status of each area, each country, then it was aiming. Also, what I thought interesting was the reaction of the government, also the policy implementation. And the, Eric, you showed about the measurement. So this is what's happening. And you had to convince people that this is what's happening, what's the next step. Then on the contrary, the last speaker and her yesterday, actually government, some of the government are interested in doing something based on science. So it's kind of interesting uh, to see that observing the different reaction to the science and the policy make implementation. This is um, something I observed yesterday. Um, also, I think I'm hearing lots of, kind of need of more measurement of modeling capability. Um, not just for the monitoring, but also the, the improving our basic understanding of the science as well. Um, but at the same time, we need to note that I, I still remember this uh, the great note from um, the Alex Sussman yesterday saying that the looking at good science, we, we science tend to aim for best science, the great measurement, precise measurement. But uh, looking at an entire picture of sort of implementation, the good science might not be. Uh, necessarily for good policy, then vice versa. Then also, he also mentioned good politics. So those are something we need to think about. Then we need to think about a good balance of everything in that picture. So it's going to be our challenge for today. Then let's see what, what we can come up uh, from this today's discussion. Um, so uh, today, so I wanted to, uh, we want to start our session uh, by a very nice uh, video presentation from 
uh, Councillor Aitikin uh, from the Glasgow State Council. Uh, let me uh, little, uh, give me a little introduction of um, the Councillor Aitikin. Uh, let me see. So the council I'm taking, uh, has leading the, the Glasgow City Council from this 2017. Um, so she welcomed the award to COP27. Uh, you might have heard of some, some of the story yesterday uh, to the Glass city of Glasgow yesterday. She's been working on uh, innovative urban city project using state-of-the-art uh, measurement system plus modeling. So we'll hear uh, how a city like Glasgow can contribute uh, to the climate also the the air quality issue. I think it's the, the yesterday's talk, the discussion at the last panel, kind of nice segue to this uh, conversation. We how our science can inform, also work together to solve the problem. So, um, it is ready. So uh, let's hear uh, the remarks from uh, Councillor Aitken. Hi, I'm Susan Aitken, leader of the City of Glasgow. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to, today to address the Asia Summit on Global Environmental Measurement and Monitoring and the critical issue of the impact of air pollution and climate on the lives of our citizens. Last year, Glasgow was host city of COP26, which was really the first COP to give a voice and a platform to urban leaders who are often leading the way in implementing solutions to our critical challenges. I believe strongly that the collaboration between cities across our planet and our willingness to share knowledge and experience offers, offers us all huge hope in addressing the climate emergency. Many of you will perhaps be unfamiliar with Glasgow. We are the largest city in Scotland and the heart of one of the biggest metropolitan areas in the United Kingdom. Our modern history is rooted in the first industrial age. Throughout the 19th and much of the 20th centuries, our name was associated throughout the world with building ships and manufacturing. We were a genuine global titan of that era of history. But while Glasgow was the first to experience the benefits of industrialisation, we were also one of the first to suffer the consequences of its decline. Our citizens, Glasgow's economy and the physical fabric of our city paid a heavy price during the decades of deindustrialisation in the later 20th century. Indeed, what were thought then to be solutions in many ways created new problems, not least the decision to build one of the UK's busiest motorways right through the heart of the city. But Glasgow has reinvented ourselves and in more recent years, we've really embraced the net zero agenda. And that culminated a few years ago when we were awarded the huge honour of hosting COP26. COP in many ways reflected the strides we've made as a city. But I've always been honest about Glasgow, about the legacies of our past and the challenges of our present. Our message as COP host was that our problems as a post-industrial city are the problems of hundreds of cities across the world and that the solutions we can bring to those challenges are also solutions for our urban peers across the planet. The former Executive Secretary of the UNFCCC, Christiana Figueres, summed it up perfectly when she said that Glasgow was the typical city in the process of transitioning. And so, friends, in 2022, when I say that poor air quality remains a clear social justice issue, a barrier to improving well-being and prosperity for too many of our citizens, I know that Glasgow is not alone. In my city, almost half of households have no access to a car, but those same households are the most affected by transport-related emissions. These impacts are well known and our knowledge of them is expanding all the time. Whether it's the impact on cardiovascular disease and breathing conditions such as asthma, or the less well-known contribution to conditions such as dementia, diabetes or cancers, air pollution affects us all and especially the most vulnerable. When I became leader of the City of Glasgow in 2017, 
My administration confronted this issue with an urgency that had previously been lacking, putting in place Scotland's first low emission zone, a scheme to phase out all but the cleanest vehicles from our city centre. We've challenged the extent to which cars can access our city centre and are restricting their use in parts of other communities. Like cities across the planet, lockdown during the global pandemic saw a major reduction in traffic and an opportunity for citizens to experience a cleaner and greener city. Much of the road space that my administration gave over to walking and cycling during the pandemic has since been permanently closed to cars. All of us increasingly recognise that data and evidence are ever more critical to informing policies and planning, but also measuring the impact of those decisions and monitoring their progress. For example, Glasgow has an ambitious target of becoming carbon net zero by 2030, and our climate plan will guide that journey. But the standards by which we assess potential actions and their progress can always be improved. This is where technical innovations around instrumentation, data collection and processing can be so helpful to local government and local policy makers. When Glasgow invited the world to COP26, we were in the process of working with GEM to develop a network of sensors to provide a detailed picture of where carbon emissions are produced at source as well as tracking levels of carbon monoxide, nitrogen oxide, nitrogen dioxide, ozone and particle matter. This network is now in place in the city and producing the kind of results that will help us monitor our climate plan actions progress, as well as judging the effectiveness of our low emission zone. For the first time, we've been able to move away from reliance on time lag data on CO2 levels and see the real time impact of our carbon output and air quality. That gives us the necessary evidence and urgency to meet greenhouse gas and air pollution reduction targets. As part of the Asian Summit on GEMS, my colleague from Glasgow City Council, Dr Duncan Booker, will speak in detail about the science and the analysis of that data. What I want to touch on briefly is how GEMS is a great example of our shared approach to addressing the challenges of the climate emergency, combining technological innovation and international collaboration to deliver solutions that improve both our environment and the lives of ordinary citizens. Glasgow has long recognised that the solutions to our challenges can't be shaped and delivered by local government or indeed government at any level alone. We know that while technical innovation is crucial in providing solutions, so too is the way in which we take a more innovative approach to relationship and partnership building across business, academia and civil society in our response to the climate emergency. The GEMS initiative is a great illustration of the willingness to work across boundaries, sectoral and geographic, to make our cities better places to live and the future of our planet more secure. Indeed, we are already developing further projects with the same partner organisations that will expand on the work we're undertaking now. This includes potential studies looking at the links between indoor and outdoor air quality and could lead to better understanding of the health impacts of personal exposure to pollution. None of our contexts or challenges are unique. They are shared hundreds of times over by our peers globally. I believe it follows then that technical innovations and new approaches to shared working and agendas, no matter where they're developed or tested, can be used everywhere. From Glasgow to Guangzhou and Kyoto, from Singapore to Jaipur, initiatives like GEMS can help policymakers wherever they are to assess the effectiveness of our plans and actions. Cities like all of ours may be where the greatest challenges to decarbonisation lie, 
but they're also where the greatest gains are to be found. I want to finish on one point. Throughout Glasgow's journey to COP26 and as we made our way towards COP27, I stress that climate action and ambition must be about more than targets. It must be made relevant to the lives, the health, the well-being of our citizens, to their communities and to their cities. GEMS is about much more than data and monitoring. It's about solutions, collaboration, urban commonality and addressing injustices and legacies by helping to create greener, safer, healthier streets, cleaner air and putting the well-being of people and planet at the centre of our shared efforts. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Councillor Aitken, for the remarks. So I was uh, lucky enough to meet Councillor Aitken at COP27 last month, uh, just briefly. Um, they, herself, also the project just she's talked about, it's kind of the reason why I can remain hopeful for the future in terms of climate mitigation. The city is one of the strong subnational actors recognized under climate mitigation activities. And the, this is a great example of how we can use uh, science technology to inform and the, the implementing actual action and COP27 was labeled as implementation cup not just uh, talking but just implementation although uh, we are not super happy with it but we are making step forward so let's make, remain hopeful for the future and again so yesterday uh, based on the lots of input from you guys uh, we uh, I accomplished the first one, they summarize current status of the measurement, environment measurement of monitoring in the Asia. So today, again, we, we're gonna do the next step. We facilitate the discussion uh, based on your input, then figure out the next steps for us, right? Then, so today, I uh, just wanted to quickly uh, go through what we're gonna do today. So we will, after this, we will hear from uh, the American Geophysical Union, the optical. Um, also, we have uh, the, we also hear from the GEM initiative. Uh, then after that, uh, we have short break, then uh, the, we have the round table discussion, uh, right? So now, I'd like to invite Dr. Luisa Town Moriner and also the Dr. Scott Connie. Uh, you want to come to the front? And um, yeah, to the facilitate the discussion. So the already, um, the, you saw uh, more, the Luisa already yesterday, right? She's the vice chair of the, the AGU Global Engagement the Committee. And also Dr. Connie sitting right there is the chief science and technology officer of the Arctic. And uh, together, uh, you guys are representing the uh, Jimmy Asia. <laughs> Thanks. Let's see when if I want to use that, I just press the arrow right just to make sure. <laughs> okay. Um, good morning, everyone, and thank you all for joining us. And I also want to uh, welcome the participants online. So, on, on behalf of AGU, I want to thank again the Asian Pacific Center for Environmental Law at the National University of Singapore. Uh, for hosting this important event, and especially to Professor Julian Lin and her uh, team at the center for their superb logistical support. Uh, so the global environmental measurements, uh, let me see. Should I use this, I guess? Yeah. Okay. Uh, the Global Environmental Measurements and Monitoring Initiative is a reminder of how critical partnership and collaboration among scientists and between scientists and other key communities are needed to build a path forward. So uh, I'm delighted to see this tremendous mix of partners from science to technology to policy and with uh, our partners from Singapore, Japan, China, uh, the Republic of Korea, and India, Indonesia, Malaysia, and the Philippines. And AGU is committed to growing our work throughout this region. Uh, as I mentioned yesterday, uh, a major part of my work is on air pollution in cities and megacities, and the impacts of air quality and climate. 
And in fact, we heard several uh, presentations and discussion yesterday on this topic. And we also heard that air pollution and climate change are closely interlinked. So by reducing air pollution, we also protect the climate. And this is evidenced by the short-lived climate uh, forces, which also were touched on yesterday by several speakers on methane and black carbon. So substantial progress has been made in our current understanding of resources and processing of emissions and their impact on air quality and climate change as a result of the improvement in our ability to monitor air pollutants and reactive intermediates from ground-based and satellite observations. And this information in turn has facilitated the development of models to explain the complex physical chemical processes and to design cost-effective emission reduction strategies. I look at how we can improve the environmental decision-making process through education and the better use of scientific, technical, and socioeconomic understanding. And this is precisely the kind of acceleration and action that we all aim for in our fields of science and something that AGU is keen to spread. So uh, AGU was founded over 100 years ago, and you see here, uh, AGU supports and inspires global community of individuals and organizations interested in advancing the discovery in science and space, the earth and space sciences for the benefit of humanity and the environment. Uh, AGU currently has about 60,000 scientist members, but actually serves a much larger community, including policymakers, educators, journalists, community leaders, and other in the science supporting public that number nearly half a million. And we need collective action to reduce pollution, transition to more efficient sources of energy, and devise solutions that protect the vulnerable communities. While discovery should remain at the heart of any scientific endeavor, we will need the entire community to accelerate actionable science. And I'll describe briefly how AG is leading three kinds of sciences and how it can accelerate actionable science. So the first one, so uh, two years ago, AGU published the strategic plan. Uh, that advances both discovery and solution science for the benefit of humanity and the environment. Now, discovery science remains central to AGU mission, but there is also an urgent need for science-based solutions to protect the vulnerable communities from the impact of environmental pollution and climate change. And to meet this goal, AGU will build on its traditional strengths in convening, vetting, and sharing science. When it comes to solutions, Scientists are sometimes called to weigh in on the ethical questions. For example, is, uh, uh, many in the global and scientific community are turning their attention toward climate change intervention methods. And in response to this, AGU uh, has uh, released a white paper that describes its plans to facilitate the development of an ethical framework to guide the research and possible deployment of climate change intervention measures including CO2 removal and solar radiation management. Now, AGU has since convened an advisory board of international experts in climate science, public policy, and public health to guide decisions about the possible use of intervention technologies. Now, just to be clear, AGU is not advocating for climate intervention or taking a position about any specific method. Instead, AGU is making a case that this ethical framework informed by the best science available should be used as society weights its option. And the initial goal is to shape the framework to a point where it can be useful for advanced global discussion. And the white paper is available uh, online. So uh, the next one is open science. Open science is critical to increase capacity and ability to work across disciplinary and geographic boundaries. AGU has committed to the principle of open science and fair data, which means that the data is findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. While technology has rapidly transformed many disciplines, 24-hour data sharing remains a problem for many regions in the earth and space sciences, as we also heard yesterday from some of the speakers. So earth and space science data is a world heritage and it is a critical part of the science ecosystem. 
all players in the science ecosystem, the researchers, repositories, publishers, the fine funders, institution, all have a responsibility to collect, develop, and share this evidence in an ethical manner that is as open and transparent as possible. And in fact, AGU is creating a culture of change by changing its uh, publication model. So currently, nine out of AGU 23 journals are fully open access, and half of all paper published are open at publication. AGU has taken many action toward open science, including participating in transformation agreement, creating a fund for submission fees, and launching the Earth and Space Science Open Archive as a free option for preprint servers. So finally, uh, community science. This is an exciting new discipline that involves collaboration of scientists with community members, and it has, is an important pathway for solutions, which we also heard uh, mentioned several times yesterday by the speakers. So community science can be led by communities or by collaborative teams of researchers and community stakeholders. This science to solution model is a key to forecasting and mitigating climate challenges. And AGU's own Thriving Earth Exchange has launched over 250 community science projects around the world. And these projects bring together scientists and local activists to effect real change in neighborhoods that are already experiencing the impact of climate change. Uh, the scientific and societal challenges facing our planet, humanity, and the environment cannot be addressed shortly by the scientific community. And as scientists, we must build a precious trust between the science and the society. So in conclusion, connecting and partner Partnering broadly is essential to achieving our vision of a thriving, sustainable, and equitable future. And in the coming decades, we must aim to make our partnership broader, more collaborative, sustainable, and consequential. And thank you very much for your attention. Hello, uh, I'm Scott Carney. I'm the chief scientist at Optica. Uh, Louisa, thank you very much. That uh, was great. Um, the American Geophysical Union has been a great partner in GEM, in the GEM initiative, and uh, we at Optica sincerely appreciate uh, your participation representing AGU here with us. Uh, many partners have contributed to the success of this meeting, and I would like to single out just a couple uh, for their uh, particularly uh, good and uh, hard work. Uh, first of all, our chair, uh, Tomohiro Odo, from the University's Space Research Association and the University of Maryland, as well as uh, Jolene Lin, uh, Professor Jolene Lin from our hosts, uh, the Uni National University of Singapore, who have made this uh, really a, an incredibly smooth running and productive event. Uh, thank you, Jolene, and thank you uh, to NUS broadly. Uh, yesterday, we heard presentations from many experts on law, policy, technology, uh, and the science behind climate change. They represent just a small sampling of all the countries and regional interests in Asia, and an even smaller part of the expertise available in this region. We're here on the second day of the GEM, Asia, Optica, and AGU, and all of you are here to learn from all of you uh, and partner with you on these pressing issues. Environmental challenges are whole world challenges and a long-term project. Today, we look to the future and to a global effort, a world-spanning partnership. Uh, I've been asked since I've been here a few times what Optica does, and yes, we do have something to do with glasses, like eyeglasses and lenses and lasers, um, but I'd like to take a minute uh, to tell you a little bit about my scientific home society. Optica was founded in uh, 1916, uh, so we've got a few years under our belt, and we are uh, of similar age to our good sister society, AGU. 
uh, in Rochester, New York, uh, as the Optical Society of America. A handful of business leaders, engineers, technicians, and scientists working in optics saw the need for a society to connect their various efforts and provide a forum to share advances in the field. And today, Optica is nearly 24,000 members, uh, well, and over 400 student chapters uh, around the globe. We are, as of, I think, yesterday afternoon, some 380 corporate members and a growing community at that. I'd like to draw your attention, of course, to the distribution globally. You'll see that, yes, the plurality of members are still found in the United States, but you look to Europe and find nearly half as many members there. And of course, right behind North America, you will find Asia and Oceania with 7,000 members, and most importantly, the largest number of student chapters of any region. Uh, the student chapter representation uh, is really an indication of the youth and vitality in the region's potential for growth and the potential for partnerships uh, to really change the world. Um, those students, through those student chapters, uh, will become the next generation of leaders and scientists and policymakers and business people in Optica and in the optics and photonics community. And they're being trained uh, through programs like uh, the Innovation School, the Subsea Optical Fiber Communication School, the Siegman International Summer School on Lasers, and more programs uh, all run by Optica Foundation uh, to foster uh, the coming generation of leaders in optics and photonics. Uh, we connect our members uh, and their work through some 30 conferences and meetings worldwide, 19 uh, journals uh, and partner journals, publishing the latest advances in quantum computing, yes, lens design, biomedical optics, LIDAR, remote sensing, lasers, and image processing. Our community is inventing the next generation of technologies. They are tr treating disease, discovering new science, and measuring just about everything. Um, we engage industry through the world-class research of our members and make that available to them. Uh, but we also uh, convene gatherings like the end user workshops and industry summits uh, that have now come to be a hallmark of our industry outreach efforts. Uh, and as you can see here uh, from this rather overwhelming slide, uh, we're incredibly successful now in uh, gathering momentum in the industry. So Optica is governed uh, by a volunteer leadership who are committed to the mission of the society uh, and represent our global community. Uh, today, we are fortunate to have President Satoshi Kawata uh, with us. He succeeded 2021 President uh, uh, Professor Connie Chang has named. Uh, next year, uh, Professor Michal Lipson will step into the role, followed by Professor Gerard Loix the year after. Uh, George Bayes serves as our treasurer, and of course, the whole operation is kept running by our CEO, Liz Rogan. Despite the founding name, the society was, from the beginning, decidedly international and inclusive. The first volume of the society's uh, journal contained a review of applied optics in England and France, establishing the global connectedness of workers in the discipline, a tradition that continues through to today with, with recent special issues in our journals on optics in Africa, optics in South America. We have a partner journal in China, close ties with societies across Asia, and of course, our sitting president from Japan. And next summer, we'll host a major conference in Busan, Korea, where a global society advancing optics and photonics worldwide. Optica engages in public affairs to expand our community, uh, our members and our customers, to grow opportunities for that community and to do good in the world. The International Public Affairs Committee, uh, founded by our own 
Tom Baer, who joins us today and currently serves as chair of the GEM Initiative, is focused on impact around the world, and particularly in areas of health and environment. The mission of the GEM Initiative and its network is to provide trusted and actionable environmental data for local impact. We bring together science, technology, policy stakeholders, that's all of you, and I hope that you will continue to help us build the table at which we all meet, and that together we can shape the future of GEM and our shared global climate. Thank you all for your time. Thank you for being with us here today. This summit uh, is critical, I believe, uh, to the future of the planet. Uh, we are beginning something here today uh, that will uh, be resonant for years. Uh, and it is now my pleasure to transition us uh, into the rest of the session covering our existing GEM centers uh, in the United States, New Zealand, and Scotland. And please, let me introduce my friend, colleague, past president of Optica and driving force behind the creation of GEM, Professor Tom Baer. Well, good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to be here. This has been a year or two in the making, and I'd also like to thank Jolene Lynn and her staff for uh, cooperating with uh, all of us at Optica and AGU to make this happen. Uh, if we could have the first slide. Uh, we're going to be changing gears here a little bit and talking about the rest of the world. Uh, the rest of the world outside of Asia and where GEM has been active over uh, the last five years or so. Uh, we'll be having talks from uh, Dr. Ron Cohen uh, from uh, UC Berkeley, uh, Dr. Grant Allen from the University of Strathclyde in Scotland, and Dr. John Harvey from uh, Southern Photonics and the Dowd Wall Center of Optics and Photonics at the University of Otago in New Zealand. And they'll be covering GEM activities that have been going on for the last few years to give you an idea what GEM uh, has been about as it's grown from its beginning to today. So, uh, of course, you've heard that G the GEM initiative is about Optica and AGU as joining forces and working together in the area of global environmental measurement and monitoring. Somewhat obvious why AGU would be involved with this, but it may not be as obvious why Optica is involved. And here are some examples of optical optics and photonics technologies that are key elements in just about every uh, environmental measurement technology. Of course, in satellites, we heard yesterday about the beautiful work being done in Korea on CubeSat satellites, where both active and passive imaging are key, key elements in measuring atmospheric constituents, including greenhouse gases and pollution gases. Lasers and spectrometers fly in airborne platforms in order to measure uh, uh, atmospheric chemistry, the ozone hole, and the dynamics behind the formation of the ozone hole, and play a critical role in that area of climate observation. Uh, LIDAR allows uh, distant uh, measurement of both anthropogenic and natural sources of greenhouse gases. And uh, point sources, we'll hear about this from Ron Cohen. This is some of his work. These point source measurement technologies involve non-dispersive infrared measurement of CO2 levels and laser scattering a measurement of PM2.5. And finally, in the oceanography and ocean measurement, the Argo biogeochemical sensors, uh, there are about 12 measurements that these systems make all over the oceans. There's about 5,000 of these things present at this point in time, about two thirds the uh, instrument systems use optics and photonics to measure critical parameters of what's going on in the ocean. So I just want to briefly start by saying this is how I view what we're doing as, as, uh, as communities here trying to deal with climate change. We are uh, the science AGU and, and Optica for the most part are scientists and we're involved with making precise measurements of the environment. These go into temporal and spatial models and we uh, iterate those models, usually inverse models, and then get consistency between those models and the measurements that we've been making. Those, measure, those models are useful for being, being able to make future predictions, so we can tell the trajectory in which the climate is, is evolving, and we can then improve the models by seeing how well we are able to predict those, uh, those uh, particular uh, trajectories. Our uh, responsibility does not end there. Those models need to be translated into what is the impact on society. And that involves economists and social scientists, as we heard yesterday, and we'll hear about that also from Grant Allen today. 
And then those economic and social policy analyses then feed into government, uh, government policies. We're not done until we complete this loop. And so that's part of what we're trying to do in GEM. And as part of the GEM initiative, what we have tried to do is assemble in universities around the world all of the key stakeholders that are involved in, these, in, in making those feedback loops. Uh, of course, climate modeling, climate science, uh, measurement technology, industry to make commercial products to make this uh, re realizable from a practical point of view, international standards organizations, climate services, and that I mean by economic models, policymakers, et cetera, and the legal structure. And finally, then, of course, government policymakers. This is the community that we brought to here to, uh, here to uh, Singapore, and these are the meetings that we've been organizing under the GEM banner. Uh, we have GEM, uh, GEM centers located throughout the world. We have about five active centers, as indicated here, and discussions within another dozen places throughout the world. And we'd love to talk to people in Asia who would like to join us in this community as we go about trying to bring about the, uh, the solutions present in, that are necessary for our, uh, for, for our civilization. As an example, I want to talk about a particular collaboration that's taken place between the GEM Center in Northern California and the one in, in Scotland. And uh, we put together a video for COP26, and this pretty well explains uh, what, we, what we intended to do and what we have done. So this pretty well summarizes what we're trying to accomplish here in terms of bringing together uh, aspects uh, and uh, expertise in the different GEM centers and uh, benefiting from the synergy of combining them. And Optica and uh, AGU provide the global network that allows this to happen. So uh, I would welcome discussions with all of you the rest of today in terms of how uh, what would be of interest to you in, in joining with us in building this as a real a true global network, including uh, institutions here in Asia. So now let me introduce uh, my colleague from uh, University of California, Berkeley, uh, Ron Cohen, who will speak in more detail, more technical detail on the uh, uh, aspects of the joint project between uh, Northern California and, uh, and uh, the uh, Glasgow City and the University of Strathclyde. Hello, uh, thank you for that kind introduction, Tom. One sec. So I wanna follow up on things you've already heard this morning about the connection between 
scientists and the cities they live in and how uh, collectively we could work together to provide uh, the kinds of information that our, our urban policymakers might want to address the air quality and greenhouse gas aspects uh, of the emissions and ex human exposure and health. So I'll do this through the context where I'll mostly talk to you about mapping urban CO2 emissions. And uh, I'm thinking when we do this about distinguishing between CO2 emissions that happen in the downtowns of cities and then in the more rural or remote locations, the suburbs where uh, people live. You see just an example here of the, the high rises in downtown San Francisco and the difference in the urban structure just a few blocks away where there are more like three or four story buildings instead of 20 or 50 story buildings. So again, I'm interested in sort of think, having you think about two questions. What observations would support cities evaluation of their own successes in various kinds of emission reductions? And then how can uh, we use observations to point to policy options that are a win on climate, air quality, and equity? So the strategy we've been using, and it's one we use uh, in the San Francisco Bay Area and in collaboration with our colleagues in Glasgow, uh, it's, um, we've named it the Berkeley Environmental Air Quality and CO2 Observation Network. Uh, you can see that here the San Francisco Peninsula is about uh, 10 kilometers wide. So you can, those, each green dot is a place where we're making measurements and the measurements are about two kilometers apart. And the idea behind this is to bring air quality and CO2 measurements together uh, at every location we make a measurement so that we're always thinking about those two things in tandem. Uh, to just uh, to address some of the things you heard from Louisa Molina, uh, the data that we collect is uh, public and Im immediately open access. So we're also trying to engage on the other criteria you heard were important uh, to AGU and to Optica. The, the instruments, Thomas showed you a couple pictures of this. We're measuring six things in each of those locations. It's CO2 and particles, and those are both with optical instruments. And then four air quality gases, NO2, NO, ozone, and carbon monoxide. And uh, those are uh, electrochemical measurements. They're, uh, we're able to do this because folks who were making industrial alarms made a tremendous progress in the precision of what their sensors were able to do. And so now instead of being an industrial alarm marking a threshold, you can measure concentrations in the atmosphere. And the key to having many, many, many measurements and making an urban map is to have both the hardware costs and the people costs to operate them be low. And we've been working on those two aspects in tandem, driving the hardware costs down low enough and then driving the, the people interpretation costs down low enough. And it, it doesn't do a lot of good to do one without doing the other. So right? as you think about the own work you might do in this space, always you know, keep the people costs in mind. Uh, I'm just gonna show you now a couple examples. Uh, here are measurements from about a dozen of those sites uh, in the San Francisco Bay Area. And uh, I'll show you an analysis of the six weeks before the COVID-19 related shelter in place where everyone around here stayed home for a while. And then in the six weeks immediately after. Um, and so here you can see what those observations look like. You can see that before that shelter in place uh, shown in blue, there was uh, obvious rush hour morning and evening uh, present in both the CO2 on the top and the carbon monoxide on the bottom. You can see that on the weekends, there was much less activity. Uh, so there was not the obvious uh, commute in the same way. And then you can see that uh, when the cars were off the road and that's the first six weeks of the strongest shelter in place, the emissions of both molecules were much, much lower. Um, we were able to do uh, a formal inverse on the CO2 measurements. Um, 
the publication was in Geophysical Research Letters in fall of 2020. And I wanna emphasize a couple of things. One is that it was six months from those observations to a publication. So one of the keys we believe in supporting our policy colleagues is being able to give them feedback on whether or not their policies are working as they intend on, on a timescale where they can make adjustments. And so six months from measurement to publication, it means that it was really more like three months from measurement till we knew what the answer was. Um, so with that, that puts us on the right time scale. Uh, this was work done by my postdoc, Alex Turner. He's now a faculty member at University of Washington. And what you see here is that the CO2 emissions in the Bay Area were uh, about you know, 400 tons of carbon per hour with uh, strong peaks in the morning rush hour. That's the black line on the top. And then after the shelter in place, those were much lower, all below 400 tons instead of almost all above and a much weaker morning rush hour peak. You see the orange is the traffic related emissions. Uh, that was almost always above the stationary sources uh, early in the early period. And it's almost always below the stationary sources in the later period. So a, a pretty substantial change in the emission patterns. And this observing system is capable of identifying what changed and why uh, over this time period. You'll also notice that the weekends didn't change all that much uh, compared to the weekdays. Uh, people were still driving and getting groceries and whatnot and doing their weekend errands. Um, but it, it's not just in aggregate that I can show you that. I can put those uh, inferences on a map. Uh, here, uh, the carbon monoxide is from my student, Naomi Asimo. Uh, and you can see the comparison between the CO2 map and the CO map that emissions changed, uh, both CO and CO2 on the roads changed in the same place, not surprisingly, uh, and they changed in, uh, in different amounts. Uh, and those amounts allow us to be more specific when we attribute uh, changes in emissions to specific sectors of the economy. That's the overall goal of this project is to really be able to narrow down uh, one kilometer pixel by one kilometer pixel where emissions come from and uh, whether or not policy is making changes in those emissions. So I'll just show you that the emissions changes were not uniform with time of day. They were different in the middle of the night at 1 a.m. than they were in the middle of the afternoon at 13. Um, and they were different in location and by CO2 was different than CO. Uh, so we were able to put something together to uh, a year ago now for the COP26 in Glasgow, a set of measurements that at the time were the set shown in those yellow stars. We've added a few since that time. And then to the CO2 observations from that network are shown here. And then to do the same kind of an inverse, where we showed that um, we could learn something about emissions uh, in Glasgow. Uh, here it is on a map and the emissions that CO those CO2 measurements have tell us that the emissions in the downtown of Glasgow are slightly higher than the local emission inventory that we used as a first guess for what the emissions were. Uh, just quickly, a couple other things that we've been able to learn. We've been able to combine data from this network to measure the average fuel efficiency of the vehicle fleet. So here we observed that vehicles uh, in the California area that we work in San Francisco uh, became more fuel efficient at 3.8% per year when this uh, the policy model that we compared to was about 2.5% per year. So cars are getting cleaner faster. From a climate point of view, that's a good thing. Uh, we're also able to measure the role of speed. Uh, during that COVID-19 shelter in place, we had a few weeks where there were, there were no traffic jams in the morning and evening rush hour. And so cars went, uh, were free flow for quite a lot of the time. And we were able to then use that to get the speed dependence of emissions and show that even though the vehicle fleet's getting more fuel efficient over time, the speed dependence of the vehicles uh, is exactly as predicted by uh, existing models. 
So I want to close out by uh, showing you uh, where we are. Uh, we have four coll active collaborators in, in Glasgow at the University of Strathclyde, at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles, at the University of Leicester, and at uh, Brown University in Providence. Uh, and we're in discussions with others. Uh, we'd love to join you and share software, hardware ideas for how to do this uh, yourselves or in partnership with us in, uh, in any way through the connections that GEM is building. So just to then summarize, what we showed is that for CO2, we can make rapid reports of changes and attribute those emissions by sector. Uh, we think our tools are ready to support these and other key elements of greenhouse gas urban reduction plans and also the air quality plans. And uh, locally, this work is supported by a fabulous team of grad students and they, they would be excited to connect with grad students and colleagues uh, around the world as we try and uh, work on the climate problem together in the various ways that we do. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ron. I think that is just a superb example of what, uh, we, what we can accomplish in GEM and working together uh, to uh, provide measurements that are truly actionable science. The next speaker is uh, Grant Allen uh, who, uh, from the University of Strathclyde uh, at the Department of Economics. Hey, thanks very much, Tom. Hey, thanks hey, for the invitation to speak. It's been lovely to see so many interesting presentations yesterday and learn from what's happening well outside Scotland. So, so thanks very much for that. Is it possible to put the notes up here, folks? Or am I in the wrong place? got some spontaneous comments written down just just to help help me here so fantastic thank you seamless after seamless brilliant hey so if i use this to move on uh, yes, yeah, so, so just introduced the University of Strathclyde, which we mentioned a couple of times this morning. So this is a leading international technological university based in the centre of Glasgow. So next to that lovely kind of green square you saw in one of the videos from uh, the leader of Glasgow City Council. The university was set up to be a place of useful learning. Uh, and uh, uh, the university's mission is to make a positive difference to the lives of our students, to society and to the world. We also, in addition to our teaching and research activities, uh, Strathclyde uh, aims to collaborate and work with industry, government, and the third sector to take our research in to uh, improve the world. The uh, university has won various awards recently, which I'm contractually obliged to show at the start of presentations, including being the only university to win the Times Higher Education University of the Year twice, uh, which is something we try to mention at all points in time. Uh, the GEM Centre at Strathclyde uh, takes an interdisciplinary approach for reasons that I'll explain shortly and it's very obvious for people uh, for the last couple of days of what we've been hearing about. The Strathclyde Centre was launched in 2018 uh, and brings together research activities across the entire university, all the four faculties from departments, from physical science, from life sciences, engineering, as well as my own Department of Economics, as well as colleagues from law, politics, and mathematics. The centre is inter interdisciplinary because we're trying to look at uh, topics that have interdisciplinary re requirements. We can't deal with these in isolation uh, from these different research silos. Uh, we've run a couple of events uh, through GEM, interrupted by the last couple of years of the COVID pandemic. We had our, our very successful launch event in September of 2019, and then we had an event to coincide with Glasgow hosting COP 
uh, in November 2021, where we looked at uh, where our, our event was, was titled Monitoring Urban Greenhouse Gases and brought together uh, uh, around 400 delegates, uh, both in person and hybrid uh, from, I believe, around 37 countries. It's a really fantastic event there. Uh, the areas of work that my, uh, uh, my colleagues and myself look at really span a, a number of areas that have been looked at over the last couple of days. Uh, there's the Urban Greenhouse Gas Monitoring Project that Professor Cohen spoke about uh, just previous, uh, which looks at uh, which developed uh, uh, urban air quality sensors between Strathclyde and UC Berkeley. Uh, other colleagues in the GEM Centre at Strathclyde are looking at a whole variety of other areas where environmental measurement and monitoring can be usefully applied to addressing societal and policy uh, questions. Uh, fresh water resources, despite famously wet country of Scotland, uh, we, we have, we're projected to become drier, uh, to become warmer, uh, uh, and climate will have an implication for lots of economic activities that currently take place in Scotland that we need to prepare for. Uh, so my colleague Scott McGrain leads our work on freshwater resources. We also do work looking at marine optics and remote sensing in the ocean environment. Uh, and we also have colleagues developing sensor materials that can be applied to understand process emissions better. So we've got a whole range of experts looking at developing technologies and applying these technologies to better understand policymakers' concerns. My role uh, and the role of my colleagues from the Department of Economics is to inform and make a link between the data that's coming out from these expert areas to the policy concerns of local and national policymakers. Uh, we're helping to understand how fit for purpose this data can be and to, uh, and to design and improve the metrics that are being used to understand uh, the responsibilities, the actions, and the consequences of those actions. Uh, we saw before that Glasgow, like Scotland uh, as a whole, has set itself ambitious targets uh, around emissions reduction. Targeting Glasgow is, is a nine year mission by 2030 to deliver equitable net zero carbon climate resilient living by 2030. So, as, as well as ambitious emissions reduction, it's also seeking to do so equitably and in a climate resilient way to make us prepare for the future. Uh, this, this really starts to bring together the economic information for the city, which Councillor Aiken mentioned the relatively low level of car ownership and also the exposure of non car owning households to urban air quality issues, as well as the health consequences of poor air quality, which can also be may lead to improving economic outcomes if those health concerns can be resolved. Uh, some of the work we've been doing has been trying to link these emissions inventories and emissions data down to economic data at sectoral level and at household level, so we can start to show the relationship between emissions numbers and economic activity on the ground. Uh, the emissions data that uh, the Glasgow Council work with as Ron mentioned, it comes with a lag. It's also uh, the current metric, so it comes with an 18 month lag from the end of the year to the release of the data. So, so the kind of real time measurement data can really make it transformative for what policymakers can see when they're developing policies. They can see the consequences of things far sooner because of this. The other challenges are with the data we have, it's currently coming from estimated a, a emissions based on energy demand, transport movements, electricity consumption in the area. So, so at a local, so at a, at a local authority level, at a, at a city level, we've got these distinctions between scope one and scope two metrics. So we we respond. So the city's electricity consumption creating emissions outside the city. So starting to tie together these choices, these policy choices about the nature of energy production, the location of that energy production with the kind of consequences and economic consequences for the city and for the wider region and nation of those consequences becomes really important. 
the GEM centre we've set up at Strathclyde, we were looking and we've been attempting to take a collaborative approach here throughout it. So we're not doing the research that we think is amazing. We're doing the research that we know is vital and is essential for the stakeholders that we've engaged with in Glasgow and in Scotland to improve their understanding of the challenges that they face and the consequences, perhaps unintended consequences of some of the decisions that they might be taking. Uh, we're engaging with, with local Glasgow City Council partners, as well as national, so the Scottish Environment Protection Agency, who have access to some data, as well as some environmental legislative responsibilities for air, water, quality, and so on across Scotland, and seeking to link uh, with them and collaborate with them on the kinds of research that helps them understand some of the consequences of the policy decisions that they will be taking in the coming decades. Uh, it was mentioned before, uh, one of the proposals, I think by Council Aiken mentioned, one of the proposals that we're working on with colleagues really shows this interdisciplinary approach where we're self as the economist or working with air quality modelers, both indoor and outdoor measurement and uh, modeling to understand these uh, links between air quality, greenhouse gas emissions, as well as people. In, in the day, these are, uh, these are impacting on people's health with potential benefits from reducing uh, air quality, uh, from improving air quality measures. Uh, one of the things we're most proud of through the Strathclyde GEM is developing the next generation of interdisciplinary researchers. Uh, so we've established the Strathclyde Doctoral Centre in Global Environmental uh, Monitoring and Policy. This is led by my colleague, Dr. Scott McGrain, uh, which supports currently seven doctoral students from across environmental science, economics, political science, who are focusing on some of the topics that I've mentioned earlier. Uh, this is a collaborative funding model where we're, 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 we've got, got co-supervision between University of Strathclyde, University of Glasgow uh, and Stanford and Lawrence Berkeley Labs as well. So we're really keen to develop collaborative uh, PhD and research uh, studentships in this area with interested partners. I've seen the Time's Up slide. I promised Daniel I wouldn't go past that. So thanks very much for your time. The contact details are there and uh, thanks for listening. Thank you, Grant, for that uh, wonderful presentation and also, also for the work you and your colleagues have done uh, building the GEM Center at uh, the University of Strathclyde. The next speaker is uh, Dr. John Harvey, uh, who is founder and CEO of Southern Photonics, as well as uh, uh, a member of the Dodd Walls Optics Photonics Center at the University of Otago in, in New Zealand. Thank you very much, Tom. and. Uh, Kia everybody. I'm delighted to be here and I'd like to thank the organizers for um, encouraging me to make the trip. It's certainly been uh, very rewarding so far. Can we? Uh... Great. Thanks very much. Um, as Tom has mentioned, uh, I've spent most of my career as uh, an academic. Uh, but uh, more recently, I spent most of it with the uh, with a with a small startup company, which is involved in making sensors, which is uh, what, of course, um, is key to what most of the uh, work which Gem is involved in. The Dodd Wall Center uh, is a, a center of research excellence that links six of the research active universities in New Zealand uh, operating in the areas of optics and uh, quantum technologies. So much of what we've been hearing about for the last day or so has been involved with atmospheric monitoring and certainly the regional network, the GEM Centre in New Zealand uh, is involved in that, but uh, I'm going to spend much of this talk um, on the issues of water quality measurement. But first of all, I would just mention that um, Whilst we do atmospheric monitoring, the, uh, there's, a, there's a some, something which is quite different about New Zealand, and that is that the greenhouse gas emissions from New Zealand are not dominated by CO2. 
uh, if you look, if you actually add up the total greenhouse gas emissions uh, per person from New Zealand, they're quite high, but they're dominated by methane and nitrous oxide. The methane um, and the nitrous oxide are influenced by the fact that the country uh, country's major export is uh, agricultural produce. And so we have a lot more sheep and cattle than we have people. Uh, we have um, abundant energy resources. Uh, we do have a few coal fired power stations, but they are pretty well phased out. They're used only on, an, uh, as, uh, on a demand backup system at the moment if there's a shortage. And there are plans to phase them out completely. There's still some particulate um, emission and uh, problems in the cities, but they're common to uh, many cities around the world. So what I want to talk about mainly is, is water quality monitoring, because water quality is, uh, is something which is politically charged and is of concern to a large number of uh, people in New Zealand. And one of the advantages of the GEM Centre is that it's enabled us to bring together people who wouldn't normally talk to each other. So in, in organising workshops, we've had policy makers, we've had government officials, uh, we've had scientists, of course, um, but that particular mix of people has not previously uh, got together for a day just to talk about the issues which need, which need to be addressed in order for government to make sensible decisions. So I want to talk mainly about um, water quality issues here because um, New Zealand has some special issues. Just to give you some context, if you were in a, if you could sit in a satellite and look down on, on the earth directly above New Zealand, this is what you would see, apart from the fact, of course, there would be clouds there. So um, you can see that basically uh, there's nothing around us except water and two large land masses which are very sparsely inhabited, right? Antarctica and Australia. Uh, Singapore is just off the edge there. So you can see that to get here from New Zealand, uh, you've got to travel about a quarter away around the world. Right. New Zealand does, however, have responsibility for a large number of uh, small island nations. And a lot of our uh, government policy is concerned with the effect of climate on these islands, not just Vanuatu, but uh, there are a large number of other protectorates and small island communities who will potentially disappear if the predicted uh, rise in sea level occurs. So just to give you an idea of uh, what dominates our climate, there's a, there's a situation in the southern hemisphere where uh, the winds basically circulate around the globe and they're not inhibited by any large land mass at all. There's uh, the area around Patagonia, for example, and there's New Zealand. But other than that, there's nothing to stop the wind going round and around there. There have been situations where the meteorological department releases a weather balloon and uh, it, it heads off, of course, to the east. Uh, and then if some days later, it comes back again, comes over the top and it just keeps going. What the, the record is 11 times for this weather balloon to go around the world. So these, these consistent winds, when they hit the, the South Island of New Zealand, they hit a mountain range called the Southern Alps. The rising air mass releases a vast amount of water uh, as it, ex as it uh, ex expands and cools and rainfall in this region on the west coast in a narrow strip between the Southern Alps and the ocean is generally measured in meters per year. So there's no pollution problem there. It's basically everything gets washed clean the whole time. But the other side of the Southern Alps, which is where all the much of the farming goes on, it's a very different situation. So I've got a couple of pictures here. The, the, the top one is uh, pretty much what New Zealand would have looked like um, 200 years ago in many of these areas. Lots of wetlands and uh, rivers trickling through them. The more recent picture at the bottom is what's happened since uh, European civilization started to bring in intensive farming. So you can see that the, the rivers become um, the rivers become confined and the wetlands are drained, converted to pasture. So even though um, the country's been occupied, 
Maori civilization has been there for uh, 800 years. They did not do the intensive agriculture. It's the, it's the last 150 years of European um, occupation which has transformed the, the, uh, the environment. So to give you some idea of numbers, uh, in the last 30 years, the number of dairy cattle has just about doubled. Um, beef cattle have decreased somewhat and so have sheep, but these don't make very much of a difference to the water quality. The, the main problem with water quality is with dairy. There are a lot of um, ways in which this can be monitored and the, there are government agencies responsible for it, but they don't do real time monitoring. They send people out to about 1500 sites to collect some water, take it back to the lab and analyze it. What's needed, and this is what we've been working on with the GEM network, is to find a way to do more um, continuous monitoring, like the sort of monitoring that Ron was talking about for, for the air. So there are techno technologies which will do this. Um, for nitrates, for example, you can use UV absorption. Um, you can use Raman scattering, which potentially would also detect phosphates in the water, and it's nitrates and phosphates from the cattle uh, in the dairy farming that's a real problem. But um, these instruments are very expensive. We have a regulation which says the waters, the, uh, the, the, the streams have to be wadeable. Right? What most people would like is that they were swimmable. Right? But this is not advised in many of these areas because the, the nitrate levels are, are so high. So in order to, and, and everybody would like to enforce the regulations, but the only way to do that is if you were to have, for example, nitrate monitors every kilometer up a river for 100 kilometers. So that's 100 monitors, if they're $10,000 each, that's a million dollars. So that doesn't work. Um, so we would like to find a way around that, but it's, it's all about developing new and less expensive instrumentation. So looking ahead, I mean, farmers are not, uh, are not irresponsible in this way. It's just that the way that they have always farmed and there is a lot of expansion in the dairying industry because dairying is the most profitable way to farm in New Zealand. 30% of New Zealand's exports are dairy, mainly in the form of, uh, of milk powder for infant food. It's referred to as white gold. Right. So uh, basically, the country is is dependent upon that. So it's a ma matter of finding a way in which um, the farming can be done in a way that is not damaging to the environment, because the second biggest uh, export earner is actually tourism. And the tourists come for basically the clean, green environment. So uh, these are in, in some ways uh, in, con in, uh, in conflict. Right? Uh, trout, uh, trout fishing used to be very popular, but it's becoming uh, less productive. So what we need really is some lower cost instrumentation to continuously monitor in real time in the way that uh, the air sensors which are being deployed can do that as well. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, John, for that uh, summary of uh, the challenges facing New Zealand. I think we are going to close out this session with a uh, uh, presentation by Duncan Booker, who's on the City of Glasgow staff, and uh, uh, we'll end the session there. I think after that, there's a break. Very good. So. Hello everyone, it's a real pleasure and genuine privilege to be able to participate in this year's GEM Summit uh, with you in Singapore. Unfortunately, I'm here in a slightly damp and cold corner of northwestern Europe called Glasgow, and uh, it's getting properly again. But what the heart?
Hello everyone, it's a real pleasure and a genuine privilege to be able to participate in this year's GEM Summit uh, with you in Singapore. Unfortunately, I'm here in a slightly damp and cold corner of northwestern Europe called Glasgow and uh, it's, it's going to be good to meet with you properly again. But one of the highlights for me of engagement with COP26 as host city here in Glasgow was to connect with colleagues from the GEM initiative and in particular to see how drawing upon the assets we have in our cities around great universities, entrepreneurial businesses and supportive public sector institutions can help us all to address the climate emergency, to become more climate resilient and to build more sustainable places for our people, businesses and the institutions which serve them. And in many ways, therefore, I'm going to talk about the connections between policy, practice and research and how we can work together to ensure that they are drawn in ways that allow the works that goes on in labs to affect what we do here in the city in the lives of our communities. Uh, and in many ways, I'm also going to talk about the distinctly urban dimension of this because one of the key messages from Glasgow to the rest of the world as host city for COP26 was that whilst nation states make pledges, it is cities which are delivering on the promise of a low carbon, climate resilient and socially just future. And I'm sure that's an aim you all share in the very diverse places and cities from which you've gathered here today in Singapore. The other thing I would say as well is that we've got a very strong uh, and positive connection with Singapore. I visited the um, pavilion in the blue zone at COP27 in Sharm El Sheikh with the leader of the council and met with colleagues from Singapore uh, and we're very much looking forward to being at some point in person in, in your great city in the future. But it is the cities I now turn, and in many ways, our cities are the places where transformation happens, no more so perhaps than in Glasgow, where we were once a titan of the global industrial age, and now we look once more to draw upon those skills and experience to become a cleaner and greener economy and society. And we share that ambition with many other cities around the world. And this next image is of the leader of Glasgow City Council, from whom you've already heard, Susan Aitken, uh, number six from the left in this image, on the stage, uh, literally, uh, but also figuratively, of course, with other city leaders at COP26 here in Glasgow. And in the middle, you see Michael Bloomberg with Sadiq Khan, the mayor of London, who took over the chairing of C40 from um, Mayor Eric Gossetti of Los Angeles during COP26 here in Glasgow. And what's key to all that, I think, is the sense in which cities are the places where entrepreneurs and innovators and people mix be it in labs or university spaces or in the bars and restaurants, which great cities, especially like Glasgow, offer to you, uh, as, as where I suppose we forge ideas as much as we once forged metals. Uh, and therefore, in many ways, those assets around innovation are the ones we draw upon to address the climate crisis. And the images you see here of our, our innovation districts in which our universities are very much anchor institutions. On the left is an image of the Technology and Innovation Center, the TIC, the University of Strathclyde, at which last year's GEM Summit took place in person here in Glasgow, and a place where some of our key innovations around climate are already taking place. In the middle top, you see the ARC, the Advanced Research Center at the University of Glasgow, and again, a place that brings together not just people from the natural sciences, but also the social sciences, and that's something I'll come back to later. In the bottom right, an artist impression of an advanced manufacturing district, innovation district by Glasgow Airport, at which just this week um, the launch took place of a medicines research facility as well. And I suppose my point very much here is that this is how great cities like Glasgow, and many of the peers sitting in the room in Singapore, bring together what we've come to call EDS, MEDS and FEDS, looking at, for instance, life sciences, public sector, but also the higher education sector. And they are also at the heart of a kind of creativity in our cities where place is very important. As I said, it's where the innovators and entrepreneurs get together. And I think that's still very significant uh, and one we shouldn't forget. We know these things already, uh, but it is perhaps worth reflecting on how we build them uh, and draw upon them, particularly in addressing the climate emergency.
And in a place like Glasgow, we have many assets alongside those universities with national government support as well, both Scottish and UK in the case of Glasgow. And whilst some of the acronyms and some of the titles here won't be familiar to you, uh, it is a story that in many ways you're already very familiar with from your own cities about how we draw together that innovation ecosystem. Uh, and if you look at some of the names before you, uh, you see the Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult, the National Engineering Laboratory, uh, Industrial Biotechnology. These are the sorts of things which many of you will already be involved with through higher education, research institutions, uh, and through public policy input. And they are the ways in which we draw together that helix of town, gown, and communities as well to ensure that innovation takes place uh, not only in, in the natural sciences, but that we also get social policy right. I sometimes say um, that the solution to our climate emergency is to be found in physical engineering and social policy, and cities are the places where that best happens. And we've also got a number of key partnerships that we can draw upon that. As I said, Glasgow is a single city in this part of Europe, but we are connected around the world with many other urban peers, not the least of which is the Global Resilient Cities Network headquartered in Singapore, and which will have a summit in, in, this, in the city in, in the future. Uh, and this is at the heart of a response to the overlapping crises of COVID and climate and our cost of living, all of which requires the best of natural science uh, alongside social policy. And of course, one of the key legacies of COP26 was the work we were able to undertake with the GEM initiative and the slightly blurry images of logos in the top of the slide here represent that partnership, the University of Strathclyde here in Glasgow and our dear colleagues in the Bay Area of California, Berkeley and Stanford, from which we have received sensors that are now mounted on school rooftops here in Glasgow to help us monitor greenhouse gas emissions and air quality and to inform real time decision making around policy and practice in the urban environment. And that's a great example, I think, of how we bring together these different aspects of a response to the climate emergency. We also engaged with a number of other universities here in the city, for instance, the University of Glasgow, uh, through something called the Glasgow Centre for Population Health, which helps us to bring together the best of he public health data uh, and analysis with, again, public policy. Key asset that links very much to some of the areas of air quality and climate resilience that we're all interested in here today. Other partnerships include ICLE, which is the Global Collaboration of Local Government for Sustainability, and an accredited um, participant in the UNFCCC process that goes alongside every COP. They had a pavilion just near the Singapore one at the Blue Zone this year in Sharm El Sheikh, and also have an action fund uh, around innovation in urban environments, for which our friends at the University of Strathclyde have put in a very powerful application. Others include the Metrolab network, the logo of which you can see here, which is a US collaboration of town and gown formally constituted to try to push forward uh, that invaluable but sometimes intangible asset of what we have in our great cities. And Glasgow is very proud to be invited to be one of the first non-US members of this network, with all of its work very much focused on social justice for the city and addressing climate issues in particular through tech, through innovation uh, and through the best in public policy. And lest what I sound, what I talk about sounds like it's, it's all about technology and the best of natural science, and of course it is, uh, it is also about connecting ourselves to the natural world or perhaps rebuilding um, the connections which we have managed to sunder over these many years with the climate crisis. And the image you see in the bottom right here is of the Seven Locks Wetland Park here on the edge of Glasgow. It's a place where nature and city meet and where the relationship is not harmful, but is positive for our people, for biodiversity, and crucially also as a place where rainwater runoff uh, from excess rainfall here in Glasgow, one of the impacts of global climate change can take place. So working with nature uh, and working with our natural assets to ensure that the best of science goes alongside the best of policy. And the Connecting Nature logo on your left is one from an EU funded horizon project that links Glasgow to many other universities and cities uh, throughout the, the, the European continent. And in many ways, what comes out of our universities in terms of soil science, how to remediate vacant, derelict, and often contaminated land in a post-industrial city like Glasgow uh, is, cru is crucial to how we inform investment decisions, 
policy and support our people and of course non-human species too. And that light, just focusing again more on the people aspect of things, one of the key aspects for us has been a focus on the, what we call the just transition. To ensure a city like Glasgow, which experienced a very difficult and challenging transition <clears throat> as a, one of the great industrial cities, can make that next transition from being post-industrial to post-carbon. And that's something we're looking to do in ways that protect our current and future generations of workers, and also seek to build greater social justice in the city. I mentioned ICLE earlier, and through its Urban Transitions Alliance, you see an image on the right of a guidebook to support us with sustainability programs in the city, from community gardening to community ownership of land assets, for instance, that can support us in that just transition. Again, the best of social science from our universities can link with the best of natural science and give us that real asset that we can draw upon which we already had near to hand, but which perhaps we need to focus on a little bit more in order to help us consider how best to address the climate challenge. And finally, I just want to leave you with a book recommendation. Uh, this is a, <coughs> a book that was uh, published just a few years ago and won a non-fiction prize about the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. At the end of the 18th century, a group of men, and they were all men in those days, met by the light of the moon, hence the Lunar Society, uh, in the West Midlands of England, near Birmingham. And many of them were industrialists, some were scientists, as we would now understand them, and some were from the arts and culture, some were priests and ministers. And in many ways, the message there, I suppose, is about how we ensure that we move out from any potential compartmentalization of our interests and have that more expansive view of connecting across disciplines, uh, across agencies and sectors, and how we do so in ways that ensure we bring the best of natural and social science together with public policy and in ways that benefit our communities. So I commend that book to you, uh, and I commend this approach to you in terms of the assets that we have that are close to hand, that were once the ways in which we drove the Industrial Revolution, and which now, once again, can help us address the climate emergency. Thank you for listening. Enjoy the rest of your conference. So, wonderful. Thank you very much for your remark, hey, Dr. Brooker. I was also a fortunate to meet okay, Emma very quickly so, at the COP27. three, um, two, so, oh, okay. one. <laughs> right. So, Hello, everyone. It's a real pleasure. <laughs> the old pleasure too, right? All right, um, so now we are getting to the coffee break, but before going to the coffee break, uh, we want to do a photo shooting. So I wanted to invite everyone to come here and then take a picture. There are also the people who are online. Uh, could you uh, turn off your video? Then you can join our photo shooting. Testing. Oh, brilliant. Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. I hope everyone had a good coffee break. Um, and tons of food again. We seem to love to uh, feed everyone here, so glad you have um, had a break. Um, welcome back, and uh, this session is going to be um, a, an inclusive roundtable discussion. And um, no, Tom, you can't be sitting in the corner. That is uh, not acceptable. Just accept, just let us rearrange our geography. Okay. So. Okay. Um, so, um, with Tom's permission, I've asked. So, I've asked Tom's permission to start off with uh, a round of um, sort of reflections. Um, if one, if everyone could just give us, you know, one or two minutes to just reflect on everything that has happened uh, in terms of the conference, in terms of the workshop, just you know, the fact that there's been a lot of information, a lot of um, um, knowledge being shared. Um, just you know, just kind of being able to just hear from you what your observations are at this moment before we launch it. And, and, and I would like to use that actually as material to um, uh, um, shape the discussion that follows. Um, so just just this is not meant to be, um, you know, put everyone on the spot kind of thing, but just a chance to hear from um, the rest of you, um, if you don't mind. So perhaps uh, we could just go around the table starting with Eric, if you don't mind. Yeah. Well, I, I, I find GEM initiative very attractive. Uh, it's a way to, to start 
it may be too ambitious to say start solving problems, but uh, is the, the starting point. Uh, we need to start measuring. Uh, we cannot rely only on models. Uh, in Southeast Asia, uh, especially Singapore relies only on models, but models don't tell us, don't provide useful results if we don't have data to validate and, and what is missing in, in the region. So I think it would be great to integrate GEM in Southeast Asia. Uh, Singapore has uh, its own needs, uh, is developing its own capabilities, but I see that James could, uh, could help a lot to, to the Southeast Asian region. I, I'm going to allow to talk for the 650 million people in, in <laughs> across the Asian. And, and there is a lack of, of information. And it's not because they don't care about the environment. It's because the many countries, many cities have other priorities to solve. They recognize uh, air pollution, water pollution. Uh, they know that they need to, to solve their problems about uh, climate change. Uh, biodiversity is another issue in the region. So if we could find a way to incorporate these countries, these cities, into the initiative, it will be great. Uh, Thank you. OK, I think I mentioned a little bit already in my presentation uh, this morning, but let me just add also that uh, to what Eric said. Uh, yes, I, I think that, you know, personally, I, I, I think that from the meeting itself that we heard a lot of talks yesterday, it seems like there's people are doing a lot of work. Okay, but but again, these are Asia is and there's so many countries, and many are not really in, included. Even just as I said, there are ten members, so I think we added the Philippines, which is great, and we have Singapore, and then we have one from Indonesia, but we still have many other the other seven that are not included and they do have a lot of problems okay in terms of air quality and, and and the climate change okay so that's one thing i think that there should be a lot more uh you know uh, there's a disparity okay if i can if i may use that word that that some that you know air quality and and has has improved in in mostly in developed okay so-called developed but then you have a lot of developing as well as emerging nations that really are struggling. <coughs> and climate change is important for them, but I think that their entry point should really be the air pollution. Okay, that's one thing. The second is, is that I think I like to see some policymaker included. We talk about science, technology, and policy, but there is no decision makers. So I think it would be good to have some decision makers in the future. Okay, all right. Yeah, good morning to everybody. In my mind that uh, GEM should focus on three W's. Three W means the first one is what, that is what to monitor and measure. Second is when, that is in uh, time scale, whether it is hourly, daily, or weekly, or monthly, or seasonal, or yearly. And third is where, that, that is in the space scale that uh, whether it is a uniform grid pattern type of thing, or it is a area weightage, or it is a area specific uh, type of thing, like the hot spots which we are identifying. We can apply the certain principles, like if the pollutant is uh, reducing in space and time, then we can measure at a point where the quality is most crucial. And that can interpret the quality at the other points because if the quality at downstream point is, uh, or let's say upstream point is good, then automatically at the downstream point will also be good. So that type of basic uh, things we can apply. Then beside these, uh, when we, uh, most of these discussions were on the CO2, CO, NO, uh, NOx, or uh, other greenhouse gases, or even the particulate matter 2.5. Uh, related to air quality. I think we have to focus on water and soil also, because in most of the Asian countries, particularly in India, WAS is a major sector, 
water sanitation and hygiene. That is a major uh, area in which uh, we are focusing. And from the researchers and the academicians point of view, we should think of the pressure state driver impact and the response type of the studies that what we are doing. I think this summarized the whole discussions which we had maybe yesterday and thank you. Yes, sir. good morning to everyone. So uh, GEM is a, is a remarkable initiative. Uh, uh, I do feel that it should expand its uh, frontiers to include including more countries, mm -hmm. especially the developing countries, you know, to have its uh, formal center set up. And uh, so this is a very uh, massive conference at one place. So we could also look at, say, uh, uh, smaller segments, mm -hmm. uh, say, the South uh, Asian region or the Southeast region, Southeast uh, Asian region. And uh, moreover, uh, the best practices can be uh, culled out uh, in terms of, uh, say, measurement and monitoring instrumentation, as well as the, uh, the kind of uh, observations. So that can be uh, because I was hearing from Manila when you spoke yesterday about the switchover of the very common, uh, the, you know, uh, the user friendly that uh, mobile and how it can have a parallel for India too. So uh, such, such kind of, uh, you know, those uh, parallels can be drawn out and they can be uh, utilized very effectively in the domestic, uh, you know, uh, jurisdictions. And as a teacher, if I speak about it, because I'm an environmental law teacher, uh, so some kind of interdisciplinary uh, maybe capsule courses or something of that kind could also be uh, developed uh, to initiate new people, you know, the people who are interested and who may not have that kind of uh, uh, understanding, that initial understanding. So maybe all this could be looked into. Thank you. Yeah, hi, good morning. Uh, so my reflections are, uh, I mean, obviously, <clears throat> Jim uh, has a lot to offer, particularly in the context of India. Uh, when I was thinking about the policy landscape, particularly in the air quality and climate change, uh, there is a big push from the government on implementation research, because a lot of interventions are being applied now, and the current monitoring network is not adequate to really, uh, you know, assess the efficacy of such interventions. You know, various policy interventions, various techn uh, technological interventions, and all. And I think you know, the uh, gem can definitely you know offer. In, there are a lot of discussion going on on hotspot management, uh, identifying uh, you know areas where you know local versus regional uh, contribution in terms of greenhouse gas emissions and all. So I think it's a, it will be a wonderful opportunity to really strengthen gym activities in India uh, because uh, the government and in government, we have uh, two major uh, uh, points. I mean, two major sections. One is called Niti Ayag, which is the main government think tank uh, shaping policy. And they are pushing for this kind of uh, hybrid monitoring approach tied to uh, uh, you know, all the policies to get a better sense. So from that perspective, it would be really as well. Thank you. Thank you. I really enjoyed this um, two-day presentation. I, uh, hi, everyone. I'm Shrayon. I've uh, met some of you. Um, but since I'm not on the panel, I'll just say I'm a research fellow at APSEL um, at NUS. Um, and um, yeah, I, I, I really enjoyed the conference. I think the three things I would take away from this are probably um, the first one would, would be about uh, connections, uh, both of people and of ideas. So I saw so many presentations where there's people at the end saying they want to collaborate and share their technology or that they have um, postdoc or faculty positions open and they're looking for uh, people to fill those roles or just looking for collaboration of ideas. So I thought that was really fantastic and that's like the whole purpose of a summit of this kind. Um, and also uh, connections of ideas by which I mean many of the questions 
questions seem to be like, okay, I see a presentation about the Philippines, and then someone from um, uh, India or South Korea says, oh, we have a similar issue in our country, and this is how we are dealing with it, or in the, in the US. Um, so there was a question about like, federalism in the US versus in India. So that's, that's something that was really, um, that really caught my eye as well. So um, that's the first um, connections. Uh, the second one, which uh, really stayed with me is, um, it, it wasn't just all about hard science. Um, so obviously, there's like some technical stuff like, you know, molecular concentrations and things like that. But as, as someone from primarily a law background, um, what really interested me was people talking about the social dimension of their scientific research as well. Um, so for example, like women's um, e extra um, exposure to household cooking fuels. So that was really interesting to me. So just connecting the science to the real world as well, right? Or um, um, temperature in HDB neighborhoods in Singapore. So that's, that's something which I found was uh, really interesting and really helped me sort of connect what I see in the real world around me with the science that was being discussed. And the third is not so serious. It's, um, it's the food, which I really enjoy. I'm um, still digesting my um, morning coffee uh, quay, and I know it'll soon be time for lunch. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> yeah, hi, good morning, everyone. This is, uh, this is Sujong Jong. Uh, this is my first visit in JAM community. Yeah. Actually, it was fun, and I learned many environmental issues in Asia. Uh, I only have one comment: if uh, if we can, if we pass, if we possible, we want, we can develop one specific agenda to address the environmental issue together. Because we have many cities in here: Seoul, Tokyo, and Jakarta, Singapore. <laughs> So maybe we can develop uh, one specific project to make a better policy based on scientific activity. Yeah, that's my comment. <laughs> yeah. That's all. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, this is Seungmin Lee from Korea Environment Institute. Uh, it was very meaningful time uh, to me uh, because I learned about Lots of many things, lots of things about air quality and greenhouse gas uh, improvement and policy. Also, after I go back to Korea, I would like to apply uh, those things to my research. Thank you. Yes, hello, hello again, uh, John Harvey here. Um, one thing which has stuck with me um, is the diversity of the assembled people here and of course that reflects the large number of countries and um, from our experience uh, in New Zealand the, the big benefit of the GEM system is to get different sectors of the community um, talking about common problems which they wouldn't normally get together and talk about and uh, hopefully uh, similar benefits will accrue in, in Asia, but given the vast scope of um, different cultures and so on, the world, then it, uh, it should be perhaps more than one regional center. Thanks. I'm lucky enough to have helped organize all of this and can't say thank you enough to all of you for working with me along this process. As a uh, transnational legal issues lawyer myself, uh, very engaged in climate policy and uh, science innovation, it's been wonderful to get much more of a depth of knowledge on your environmental measurement and monitoring work and how we can all work together to really solve some of these problems and use your science uh, for good. Uh, the policymakers like Jolene's in law as well as the, the government people who have uh, been here with us as well to make all these elements come together for good. It's really inspiring about the things I can see all of us doing here together. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, just to add to what's been said before, just, you know, just quickly, I think the, uh, the community here in the room has been really positive, really enthusiastic for collaboration, which I think is really, really encouraging. As John mentioned, the kind of diversity of the stories that each group has been talking about, 
also the kind of areas of common interest for science-led evidence to contribute to policy actions. So yeah, some of the specifics I can see you can have in Glasgow and Manila, having specific interventions around local transport, for instance, having really economically important and socially important, culturally important activities that kind of policymakers in each area are starting to kind of think about how to respond to appropriately. I think that's where the kind of local expertise of each group or each country really needs to be kind of bottom up, kind of adapting what the technology can provide to the local conditions and the local priorities. So both air quality, climate change, as well as the kind of economic importance of the for the areas too. So thanks a lot. So, and a fantastically, a fantastic bunch of people. Let me just say thank you. Okay, um, thank you for having me here, and this is my first time to join uh, this community, and um, I'd like to uh, 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 mention two points that I'd like to take uh, back to Japan, and the first point is that, uh, you know, uh, many of people uh, mentioned that uh, uh, the problem or issues in the age is so diverse, and uh, uh, all the, like air pollution, uh, I think it's not that much um, uh, highlighted in Japan, but as a whole Asia, it is. Uh, I learned that it's a very important issue. And the second point is that uh, maybe uh, uh, from uh, observation, uh, from uh, observation community, uh, the, this is a very uh, a good opportunity for us to learn the uh, exact uh, issues and problems that are facing. Uh, uh from uh, all the countries so i i like to um maybe uh contribute to uh, uh, keep a dialogue with, with all of you thank you thank you very much this is Ivo Kano, yeah and uh, i'm yeah, very much impressed by the very high level talks yeah from yeah yesterday to today and uh yeah that one thing is that uh i renew the yeah concept that uh yeah, there are, the time constraint to solve the yeah the climate change issue is yeah very much significant and uh, yeah it used to be a, a sampler to, uh, future uh, issue in 100 years <laughs> from now but uh, yeah it is not right right now and uh, yeah we are very much pressed yeah needed to 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 go forward to convert the uh, observable and observed information to the yeah to the actionable uh, information right so then yeah we should not yeah the, our communication should not should not be the bottleneck <laughs> and the, here's a yeah good example to start our communication to to make the smoother communication in between the scientists as well as the uh, scientists to the policy makers so that's yeah the one thing i <laughs> renewed my idea right now and uh, yeah for that perspective that yeah converting the information to the that of course the emission change is the important uh, knowledge to that we should develop and uh, yeah it, to see if that we are on the right track to the future and then yeah but the how to do that is a, a significant issue and the safe system development is quite important for that and uh yeah of course for the pers perspective of the ipcc new slcf inventory perspective as well as the yeah here i didn't mention but the arctic council perspective like uh, japan is an observer there and of course korea china india and singapore are the observers there and then we are requested to participate in by uh, deriving the black carbon and methane emission information to save the whole the earth so we are asia but uh, we are the part of the globe so then yeah with this perspective we should be able to move forward uh, based on the uh, our <laughs> reliability and uh, uh, consensus uh, that is to be achieved quite yeah uh, you know, on this opportunity and so on yeah thank you very much um two i think um my takeaways are the first one is a uh, gap in <clears throat> in translation in language i think uh, not, not, well, not just uh, the spoken language of English, but also I think uh, between 
uh, hard science and uh, legal science, social science. Uh, I think what we're trying to do here is very commendable because then everybody is, we sit together and try to understand what the other people are saying. Myself, not very uh, successful in, <laughs> I think like I can understand uh, 60% of uh, what 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 we are discussing, which is uh, already good. And then the second the second thing my take takeaway is uh, the technological gap between countries. Uh, I think um, uh, we can see the gap between developed and developing countries in terms of um, you know the technology that they're using, the knowledge that they have. And I think Gem would be like a good venue for uh, all of us to come together uh, share technology transfer whatever it is uh, the knowledge that we can share uh, i think um, i think this uh, the 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 importance of uh, this network would would multiply with time i think thank you Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Celine. I'm a research assistant with EPSEL. Uh, I was not a panelist, so I was just watching from the chairs. But I just wanted to say thank you so much for all your sharings. I really have learned a lot. Um, and I think that one of the biggest takeaways for me from this conference was just seeing for the first time, really, um, what are the technicalities that would go into environmental decision making, monitoring, etc. And I think it really opened my eyes to the realities of what um, information demands we have. And I think this would help me going forward, um, trying to develop my own ideas about how can the law um, and policies meld with harder science and try and take that forward to solve environmental problems. Thank you. Hi, my name is Aisha. So I'm I'm actually a master student from uh, Malaysia. So actually, uh, we would like to first thanks to Optica for allowing us to be here, and uh, also um, environmental changes challenges uh, is one of the major problems in Malaysia. Also, so from what I heard, um, it's uh, uh, it's a good information, and uh, uh, I think. Uh, from what I do in my research also, I'm, I'm actually, I'm actually um, doing some organic method to, um, uh, to uh, sorry, I'm actually nervous, <laughs> um, uh, uh, to solve the environmental problem also. So therefore here, um, I've learned a, new, a lot of things and actually this is a, a new thing for me and thank you. Um, good morning. Um, I think the initiative to connect science to policy and engaging uh, various disciplines like the economics and social science is very timely. Um, a good example would be our GPD um, problem in the Philippines. Um, coming from the science side, um, I realize, yeah, we need to strengthen our science, but we also need to talk more. Um, with various stakeholders in order to convert this information into actionable points. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I think um, a lot of the points on my list have already been raised. But I think um, what I wanted to highlight and uh, a great learning opportunity also for this event is that uh, we talk about a lot of monitoring uh, goals and objectives, but I think the really next crucial step would be to integrate these efforts to inform, of course, policy and decision making. And then air pollution and climate uh, change as a chance, the transdisciplinarity uh, nature of these issues would require, of course, not only the technical, but uh, adaptive work actually and this uh, includes going down to the cities and communities to understand what they really need in terms of technologies and policies and capacity building and I think lastly um, what I like about what was mentioned earlier was that <clears throat> the use of the data or the information and um, using that to analyze even the existing policies that we have uh, to check their effectiveness or efficiencies would really be a great 
tool for our cities to look at how they could reform and improve their ways of working as well for their constituents. So thank you for this opportunity. Well, thank you. Um, three points. I had a lot of time to think about. Thanks for starting over there. <laughs> I'm not here. <laughs> um, yeah. So the, the first one, I mean, this meeting just showed again that uh, how important it is to have observations. Um, um, just to, to, to show and demonstrate the need for action to governments and policymakers. Uh, it's quite instructive to see how PM 2.5 values can be exceeding uh, guidelines to a uh, huge extent. And uh, maybe this is one way to convince others to do something about it. Um, there is a need to go to other places than just the usual places, uh, to places uh, where environmental monitoring is perhaps lagging behind. Uh, so there's a need for technology transfer, hardware transfer, education, uh, finance transfer. And the, the last point is a more of a philosophical point. Uh, I think I mentioned yesterday already, um, environmental problems are people problems. Uh, so we have to bring people and humans, um, human beings, uh, persons back into the discussion as well. And many of the problems we actually, we know enough right now to, 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 for, for actions. We know what needs to be done, but it's not being done. Why is it not being done? So maybe we have to study the behavior of people a little bit more. Thank you. Thank you, Matthias. Uh, Scott Kearney, uh, Chief Scientist Optica. I would just like to say, uh, from a personal perspective, uh, the thing that has impressed me here is uh, this amazing group uh, of diverse individuals coming from many hundreds, some, some cases many thousands of miles away, have come here in Singapore and within the span of two days developed an enormous amount of camaraderie and willingness to cooperate and eagerness to cooperate. And uh, that to me is more impressive than anything else that has happened here. I think it speaks to the power of getting people together. And I'm, I'm really glad uh, to have met all of you here uh, at this meeting. And in fact, I think if tomorrow morning we wake up and by some miracle, they have announced that the climate problems are solved. I will call all of you back <laughs> with a simple question. OK, what's next? Uh, because I think this group can take on anything. And so uh, thank you all for being here. And uh, I give you Satoshi Kawata. Thanks. Uh, first of all, I was uh, very lucky to be here to learn the diversity of the issues and uh, learning the data and uh, many uh, views about the environments. And uh, it's uh, still very diverse, so not easy to summarize for, for us at all, but it's worth to start to discuss. And uh, I would like to I allow you to, please allow me to uh, say, uh, say about my personal issue. <laughs> I am living in a, uh, residential area in front of the street, which has uh, trees. Trees cover free the street. And uh, we have a big argument against city. City wants, wants to remove the trees to widen the uh, lane of the uh, uh, car. And we are very much against. So, but uh, this time I, I realized that we need the data, how much this covering of the tree reduces the temperature and, uh, and uh, uh, or uh, uh, reduces the uh, pollution. So we need more scientific data rather than arguing against the city. If we have a very scientific data, uh, we can convince them. And to do that, like an me scientist, optical scientist, uh, measure the temperature and uh, and uh, uh, measure the uh, pollu pollutants. And uh, uh, mathematicians will will make a model to calculate. And uh, uh, if you remove, what will happen? If you remove the trees, what will happen? If you leave the trees, how it helps our health? And uh, so I definitely need more data and i need people to to study not only this particular my personal issue but many kinds of issues 
And that's number one. And the number two is not personal, quite global, but uh, differently, completely differently from the last year, we have an, a, a very serious issue about the environment, which is a war. And the war totally damage, destroy our planet, and uh, probably increase the temperature, and they definitely increase the uh, pollution in air or water. But rather than arguing politically, if we have a data, if we have a map with the data, probably there are data about the temp local temperature or pollutants. Uh, if we have those kind of data, rather than uh, politically arguing, we can tell them how this is uh, bad for our, our planet. And uh, uh, so if there is a possibility, it would be nice to have an, at least one sentence that we were discussing about this kind, or we will discuss this kind, not politically, scientifically, and based on the evidence and the data. So this is what I uh, found through this uh, uh, one and a half discussion. Thank you. I'll just make a brief comment before I pass the virtual microphone to Wei Wan um, and Ling Li online in China. I mean, I, I guess I'll just say that, um, <clears throat> excuse me, it, it's, it's very clear from the conversations around the table here that there's uh, the commonalities across <coughs> different regions, countries, cities, um, from small to large. Uh, they may vary in the specifics, but they are very similar in on the broad level clean air clean water and the future of the planet that's what we're all talking about and really how to understand it better how to instrument it and get the data that scientists and technologists can get and then package it in a way that policymakers and lawyers can then effectuate the policy outcomes that we all know need to be made um, so i'll pass the microphone now to Wei. or it looks like you're ready oh, yeah yes uh, thank you, David. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Great. <laughs> um, I have learned a lot from the presentations and discussions. Um, the organizers have been doing a lot to make this happen, and, and you are all my heroes now. <laughs> I think GEM is a very promising platform. Uh, the city is key for air quality uh, management, climate change mitigation. Uh, in Asia, also, we used to have an old name when I joined this organization. Uh, we was called Clean Air, Clean Air Initiative for Asian Cities. So we keep growing and still lying on that base, the city network. Uh, I would like to share some thoughts on the next steps, uh, just for uh, consideration, uh, considering uh, this, I think, uh, Maybe a report or working paper, joint working paper to have an overview of the environmental monitoring and measuring in Asia to share about the status gaps and needs will be helpful and informative. Uh, this is also inspired by Luisa. <laughs> uh, she invited us to write an article to introduce the mega city of quality management in Asia. Professor Tong Zhu from Peking University and I worked on the China part. I think it was a very uh, meaningful and unforgettable experience. Uh, this kind of work can be tangible and a concrete uh, step to move forward. And we will also have a way that can organize ourselves after the nice meeting and gathering, allowing more countries and scientists to contribute. There can be started also uh, with some systematic working paper or report. Uh, I, for example, just, just an example that's uh, suggested by Professor Lu, uh, maybe the atmospheric <laughs> can be a sub uh, topic. Uh, and also our sub region, like mentioned by uh, Luisa, the Asian countries with similar situation challenge and needs, uh, but which is not representative enough from this meeting can also be a further uh, area that we can explore, just some uh, simple thought. We can explore that, of course. <laughs> Thank you. All right. 
Hi, everyone. Uh, I don't hear that. I chair of the, this workshop. Um, it's been wonderful uh, opportunity for me to lead this workshop. Thank you, Tom. Um, everyone for helping me along in this workshop. I just, um, everyone just driving this. Um, so I just saw standing there, then just uh, represent, pretend like I'm representing by all of you guys. Um, so a couple of things. I, I, if I speak, um, wait, you have that. So I think the most biggest success of this workshop is, again, a couple of people already mentioned, but we sitting together. This is the thing. And also, we didn't, uh, we might not be able to uh, covering everything uh, we should be, we should be possibly discussing. But I, this is first, again, this is first Asia workshop, gym workshop. This is a great success, in my opinion. So this is a start. This is not the end. This is really the start. So I think we, this is, in terms of this, I'm pretty being hopeful. And um, I, I also think that the, I think that why I think we think the, this is successful, because again, we all always, uh, Tend to talk to the people in the same community, but we're trying to act across the community. And the you Lina know, pointed out, um, sometimes we don't understand, the, we don't we're not speaking the same language, but this is also findings that we, we, we assume, oh, this is a problem. So we need to speak in that. They also I was uh, able to have a real chat with a grant. Um, but sometimes we also we need to understand not just language, but the, what information can be used for to the community. So I think this is something uh, based on, so this is to, almost one and a half day is a great uh, sort of process of gathering information, what's happening in this, uh, like, a, like we uh, define as the first objective, we summarize what's happening in this, in this area. So I think it's quite successful. Then I think we miss next step will be um, based on, like also I suggest that um, we need a report, so it's in summarizing, actually we, people see in this, that definitely say that they probably, everyone has kind of, oh, this could be the next step, um, but are we, do you need a kind of systematic analysis based on the information we gather this one and a half day? That's going to be an important step. Then I think based on doing the analysis, probably we find the next step more uh, clearly. So I think something uh, I want to challenge them to do that as a next step. They also think that again, the since Jem bring us together uh, here, that's a great success. But also the, this is clearly kind of showing that Jem is a you know great position to again, putting us together again, then it makes the forward. So I think a very great proof for uh, the success, the potential uh, for the Gem Asia Center as well. And the, just speaking as a, as a carbon cycle scientist, I usually tend to say things like going to the government or city council, uh, it's always difficult uh, to talk to people, but I, looking at an example of the air quality, I feel more hopeful. Oh, this is gonna be, this could be happening. And especially I, I feel it's huge potential and it's you know, effort of greenhouse gas and air quality. Um, the greenhouse gas is now it's so important problem. Everyone in this room will agree, but the urgency is not really uh, not there yet compared to air quality because of the nature of the nature of the, the problem. So I think the, um, but we don't have time, obviously, respond to the climate. Um, so I think the synthetic effort with greenhouse gas and AQ is something I really wanted to emphasize, um, say, if you light up the report. So yeah, anyway. They also well, let's let's point to the, the cards and say thought about the war. I we also actually work in some uh, work for addressing the kind of potential uh, of the the conflict between the Ukraine and also last year. And that is also we we the main want to sign this uh, not going to the, any political uh, discussion. But I I think we you know being friendly making friends is always great for us to, for everyone, for science, for anything. So I think the, we might be able to send out a very nice message to the, to the entire world. So uh, we, should, we should think about that. Yes. You want the last word? Yes. OK, OK, fine. Well, thank you, Jolene. Um, I've been uh, privileged to watch Jim evolve right from the beginning to where it is now and seen its successes. I think it's important to understand what the scientific societies who are really the heart and soul behind at least this initiation can provide. Uh, they provide peer review and scientific validation of the results, uh, worldwide publication so those results can be shared, uh, data sharing and access. Uh, they supply a global network of climate scientists and engineers uh, literally all over the world. Uh, and then an excellent support staff for organizing events like this. Uh, they cannot supply funding to support instrumentation implementation, 
that's not their role. They are very qualified to provide support for you to obtain funding or to work together. And that's going to require, if, if we're going to expand the GEM network, it's going to require in-country leadership in India and other places. So it requires leadership there. What we found uh, is Glasgow is a perfect example of how it's worked. And it, it's worked because we had a great university, the University of Strathclyde, take a leadership position and work closely with the city government. And that partnership is critical. So if you're going to proceed and would like to form a GEM center, I think you'll get tremendous support from the scientific societies, but it requires leadership there to define an institution that will play a leadership role and supply resources, mainly staff resources, meetings like this, meeting facilities like this, uh, and then involve your city government in it so we can get the policy side of it, involve the social sciences, the uh, economics departments, the legal staff, and then this will naturally crystallize. It is, it is very possible to bring these things together. Uh, we can partner, uh, we, when I say AGU and Optica, with you to identify and accrue funding opportunities. That's going to be critical if we're going to instrument and provide these measurement capabilities in cities around the world. We have to identify funding sources. Working together, I think we can do that. And we provide the validation, as I've said, that what we're going to do, be doing is scientifically sound and will be shared across the world. That's a very strong argument for funding with a number of resources. Um, but that will require working together. So I think that, that's the key. Uh, we need in-country leadership. You need to identify an institution that we can partner with. You need to contact and make, get support from your local governments and then approach, uh, uh, approach the leadership, GEM leadership, which is the uh, Optica and AGU staff and the volunteers like me who are working on it, and we will make it happen. So I'm very pleased that you all participated. I'm very optimistic that with your leadership, we can, uh, we can grow this whole effort. And with that, I'll turn it to you for... Concluding remarks? Yes. <laughs> um, do I have four minutes, maybe? Yeah. Okay. Um, so thank you everyone for sharing your views. Um, it was really useful and I've taken, out, I've taken some notes. So first of all, I think that generally that's a very positive um, uh, view that having a GEM network, uh, sorry, having GEM is, 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 a, is a good thing for the region. Um, and as Tom has pointed out, there are some key ingredients that would be essential uh, for having a, um, the expansion of the GEM network. Um, so I will not repeat that. Um, and um, I think we, there are a few things that, I th uh, that I've noted and I thought I would respond to as well, as well as summarize it. So one thing that came out quite clearly was the um, fact that there is a disparity uh, between um, certain cit some cities and the others in terms of capacity and information and resources. And the hope is that net the networks networks can be used to plug those gaps uh, and facilitate the, um, the, the exchange of, of, of knowledge and ideas and technology, as well as transfer towards those places that um, currently lack it. Um, it is true that, you know, and even in ASEAN, um, we, we only managed to include a few countries in this submit, which is um, a pity. And this is generally a case, uh, a problem. Uh, across all um, efforts that um, even this university does. So I'll just share a little bit that um, when our center does uh, capacity building for ASEAN, we actually require significant um, financial assistance provided by our foreign uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs in order to provide um, resources to those from the uh, least developed countries uh, to attend. So countries like uh, Laos and Myanmar, um, tech, Cambodia has just marginally lifted themselves out of that category that, that we can't proceed without that funding. And I think that's been, that's a, a, um, an issue that we will have to overcome, but it's, it's, it remains an issue. I, I, I hear this idea that we uh, have to be more inclusive and um, there's an idea that more decentralized meetings and workshops would be helpful to kind of build the momentum. Um, and um, the idea of the connection between people and ideas that's been very useful uh, to talk about. 
Um, another thing that came out as a, um, a focal point is the idea that cities are a focal point and it's important that we are just based on the evidence, um, cities are probably the entry point for tackling uh, the environmental challenges. Um, so I think it's actually really interesting because um, as a, I, I did my PhD on cities and how they were governing climate change. And I didn't base it on any evidence. I based it on this theory that cities were bypassing states in order to um, play a more uh, meaningful role, uh, play a, a role for themselves in international affairs. And that was shaped by my observations in Europe, where cities were becoming far more active in terms of policy making and implementation. So it's actually really interesting to actually what now fast forward quite a number of years um, that the evidence is building and there is a clear piece of evidence, uh, evidence base for that focus on cities. And air pollution being the entry point for climate change action that's been that's brought about. Um, I think that's a really important um, point, and that's being advanced in um, policy making as well as um, legal circles. Um, I'll just briefly share with you that right uh, this year, Greenpeace Southeast Asia uh, launched a um, regional campaign uh, to bring lawsuits across a number of um, Asian cities to tackle air pollution. Um, so I, I made this campaign a, a sort of a case study for a project that I'm working on uh, because I was very interested in understanding the modes of, of, of how they are operating, why did they choose air pollution, is it really air pollution they're tackling, or is it something else, um, i.e. what I was hoping was they're using, they're trying to tackle climate change. Um, so that was actually really interesting in my um, empirical work um, through interviews, semi-structured interviews, etc. It was very clear that air pollution was an entry point for tackling climate change in Asian cities for many reasons. One, it is an issue that is close to people's hearts. It is killing people and therefore people are more willing to support such legal action because they want change. They want better air for their children and for themselves. Climate change falls in, in terms of priority in opinion polls that were conducted by Greenpeace. It was very clear from the data that people saw climate change a little bit too distant, which was odd because at many of these cities, the impacts of climate change were already very clear. But Emotively, I think when people were asked and polled as to what was more important to them, they said climate, air pollution, air is bad, air, we, want, you know, we are going to die now, as opposed to 50 years later, or maybe now 30 years later. Um, second thing is that what was very clear from the Greenpeace um, um, campaign was the idea that um, we're trying to what the communication of science uh, to the communities. So I think that's a very discreet and important area that we that I would like to kind of just draw attention to, which is kind of I think the the intermediary that we kind of need more of. So organizations like Optica and AGU are really the providers of the technical science, and we who are not the scientists require communicators that would help translate that science and you know what the best example that comes to my head because i went to a lecture on saturday was brian cox he made me understand quantum physics i was like never in my life imagine i would ever understand anything about quantum physics um well there were very beautiful images i was like wow carbon dioxide emissions actually look beautiful on the screen which is not good i was like no this is not a good observation on my part but anyway what was the point the point was that um these are very specialized people but we do need more of these in terms of training but anyway so that's that's my um sum up and my reflections and um i think what will we do now in terms of next steps do we want to I noted four action items, so I guess we will follow up on that. 
I, I think we are planning to uh, put together a summary based on some excellent note takers uh, of the workshop and hope to publish those uh, this summary in uh, Optics case, it's OPN and in uh, AGU, it's EOS, uh, the two, uh, and have summaries published that record some of what was done here. I, I think the next steps, again, require leadership in country. Let us know what institutions are interested in, what cities are interested in working and forming, what we were able to pull together in Glasgow, and uh, then contact uh, OSA staff. Daniel is the head uh, of that, and uh, we will begin to coordinate with AGU and begin to uh, help assist in uh, organizing efforts uh, to uh, do what we did in Glasgow, basically. And then I, I think as you become aware of funding opportunities, and we will also be looking for funding opportunities, I think there is uh, opportunities through Bloomberg, through C40, through other uh, ICLE and other organizations. We can, as in partnership, uh, raise the funding necessary to support the technology development and the deployment of these new technologies. We just need to work together. I, I think the plan is very straightforward, and I'm actually quite optimistic that we will be able to, uh, to develop significant uh, capabilities here in Asia. But again, it does require leadership on your part, but I think you'll get a very positive response from AGU and Optica to support your efforts. I think that pretty much covers it. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to pass it to the chair. Yeah. All right. So looks like we hit all the check marks today. Yeah. So, all right. Um, yeah, they also did, please uh, just reiterate uh, what the Tom said. I think we, this is really the first workshop, the very unique one. I don't, I'm pretty, uh, everyone should uh, probably will agree with me, right? So just spread the word. You know, hey, we had a great interesting conversation at the gym meeting. This is kind of the, what we can do very easily. Then identify who can join us next. I think that's something we can quickly do. And uh, hopefully we can come back with more friends, then probably more, uh, you know, let's say more good ratio of scientists versus policy people, social scientists, probably that's something, you know, uh, next, next time we do a better job. Um, so yeah, then it's my job to conclude this workshop. And um, yeah, again, so again, as, as a chair, they thank you for everyone being here, uh, especially congratulations, Jim, also AJ Optica. Uh, so having a great conversation here, that's a great success. Again, as first step, I'm looking forward to continue conversation. Then obviously the speakers, moderators, especially um, the staff here helping us to um, make this workshop a success. So I wanted to congratulate to everyone. So uh, let's give us a hand. Right. Then again, so this meeting being recorded. So if you want to come back to um, the meeting uh, as a minute, you can use uh, recording as a minute. So you can go back to uh, the, uh, the future reference and um with that this meeting is adjourned thank you everyone see you very soon <laughs>